Hey, good morning, Brian. Um, right now I'm reading your lips. I can't hear your audio. <laughs> but hey, that's what improvisation is all about, right? And I'm yeah, no, I can go. hear you. You can hear me now? Yeah. Oh, okay. Well, cool. I don't have to switch mics then. Although I think my battery is low on this one. So I'm going to switch um, my audio microphone to my internal microphone. Okay. Can you hear me now? Yes. Mm -hmm. yep. You get it. Good. All right. Woo. Good. 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 <laughs> huh. So we talked about the importance of having our core beliefs and our core values aligned with our vision. So having our vision aligned with that, those core beliefs. Now, I, I, I said in the intro, and I apologize if uh, everyone missed it, but Jim Anseldo knows a lot about his core beliefs and his, his really his, um, his, his core values and strengths. So uh, in that, what you've been doing with, uh, with your life, um, I would like to just kind of open it up to you to really tell us what your first recollection is of first knowing your vision. You know, I think for me, it actually goes way back. Um, one of my first memories is as a little kid sitting on my father's lap um, and we were watching Star Trek and I was asking him who the guy with the funny ears was. And um, for me, my family um, being storytellers and uh, introducing me to science fiction and fantasy and the possibility of other worlds and diversity and all of that, I think was really the start uh, of the vision that I have. Wow, that's cool. So tell me a little bit more about that, your vision, um, if you would. What, is, uh, what does that mean? Well, you know, for me, I think it means that I've, always kind of recognize that the culture and the society that we've created, um, it, it creates a context for people. And so, you know, in my work, working with people with disabilities, um, it, it's always kind of been clear to me that the disability is a socially constructed phenomenon, meaning, you know, yes, people do have various physical, cognitive and emotional conditions, um, but it's the, the society and the culture and, and the way that that's structured and how inclusive and responsive it is that determines the degree to which that is limiting or not. Um, and, I, and I really, like I said, I think a lot of that comes from those science fiction worlds of seeing what happens, you know, when you create a world that has a different kind of society or culture um, that accepts and supports people in a different way. Hmm. That's very cool. If you want to hear more, stay right there. Wrong button. Different. Thank you again, Jim. <laughs> Thank you for your patience as well with the uh, the different buttons and the uh, the, the uh, different microphones, all this stuff. Uh, it, it, you're you're definitely a good improv guy. <laughs> to be honest, that kind of stuff actually puts me at ease because it's just a reminder. You know, we're human beings and we're trying to connect, and yeah. um, you know, just using the tools we have. Yeah. Uh, so for me, I, I'm 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 going to ask these questions, and I, I ho I'm hoping to to really draw on uh, what you do a little bit more. So sure. Uh, for me, I work at the Ohio School for the Blind, and there um, we have we have mostly 60% well, of the kids that go there are they have um they have disabilities that go well beyond visual impairments. So mm -hmm. they, they may have autism, uh, uh, Down syndrome, or uh, you know, you name it, um, albinism, you know, all these, all these things that go into the, the makeup of these students. And 
if, if it were me uh, and, and I were coming to you and I would say, Jim, can you can you offer something for our students? I mean, some of them have cerebral palsy. So there's really a wide, wide range of uh, of uh, cognitive abilities, I guess would be the right way to say it. Um, so what, what, if I if I were to come to you and I would say, you know, what what kind of program could you put on or do you put on for these type of students? What would what would you have? Um, you know, the work that I love to do is based in improvisational theater, um, which a lot of people might know from TV shows like Whose Line Is It Anyway? or, um, you know, The Second City in Chicago or that kind of thing. Um, but it's a lot more than just a form of comedy or theater. Um, beneath that kind of magic of creating scenes and stories and songs on the spot is what I kind of think of as a human technology for connection and co-creation and communication. Um, and so, you know, I would work with you to look at what your objectives are uh, for the group that we're going to work with and, um, you know, come up with some games and exercises that would really um, create a space where it's safe to take risks and make mistakes. Um, create a, a, a culture in that learning group where um, we accept and support, um, which if you've ever heard the term yes and in improv, that's kind of a shorthand for this idea of acceptance and support. Yeah. Um, and it's really the, the best, fastest, most fulfilling way to co-create is through this process of making offers, accepting those offers and supporting those offers. Um, and so, you know, we would build it from there and, like I said, for me, job number one is to create that environment of safety. And then um, once you create that, you get a true picture of where the, the edge is for people, of what skills they actually have and how we can push them that 10% that any student needs to be pushed in order to learn. Um, but if we haven't created those conditions, we get a false picture of what they actually know and can do. Hmm. So uh, here, I'm going to put your, your website here. <clears throat> yeah, you yeah. And that in the end of that you. So for, for yeah. the people that are listening in, uh, who don't, may, maybe they don't know about Yes And, um, mm -hmm. you, you already list, said a little bit about it, but uh, can you tell them more? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, this website is for Camp Yes And, which is a summer program uh, that combines uh, a teacher professional learning intensive with an improv-based summer camp for uh, autistic high school students. Um, but really for any group, the, the, the core of it is the same. Uh, so this idea of yes and, um, in, in improv theater, we start with a blank stage. We don't know who we're going to be or where we're going to be or what we're going to be doing. And that's all created during the moment of performance, usually based on at least one audience suggestion. Um, and so to go from a blank stage to a kind of fully realized plot setting and character um, story, somebody needs to make the first offer. And the example I always use is my scene partner might say, hey, would you like a glass of milk? And, you know, in improv, we kind of pretend to hold things and because we don't need props or costumes or anything like that. Um, and my first job as an improviser, as a scene partner, if my partner says, hey, would you like a glass of milk? The first thing I need to do is accept the reality that this glass of milk is here. Um, there's a temptation to change it into something else. It's a glass of orange juice. It's a torch. It's a fire hose. And, you know, I might get a little chuckle from my audience by doing that. Um, but I've done a couple things um, on the level of story. I've confused my audience. One person thinks it's a glass of milk. One person thinks it's a fire hose. I don't know who to believe. Mm -hmm. And on the level beneath the story is the level of us as players or as actors, whatever we want to call ourselves, team members. Um, and if I change that initial offer, I'm communicating to my scene partner that there's something wrong with that, that I don't like their idea, respect their idea, et cetera. Um, so my job is to accept the reality that the milk is there. Now, I can do anything I want to to support the scene after that. And supporting the scene in theater means just adding more detail. So I could say, yes, I would love that glass of milk. I just baked some cookies. Or I could say, no, that would make me terribly sick. I'm lactose intolerant. 
And both of those responses add more information to the scene. And so then that becomes a new offer for my scene partner to accept. Oh, this person's lactose intolerant. What if I make them my um, college roommate that I've known for five years and I've just found out that they're lactose intolerant? Let's play with that idea. And we go back and forth and build a scene from that. Um, and so when we take that idea off stage, it becomes really interesting to think about what does it mean to accept the reality that somebody else is living in and support that? Even if I live in a different reality, even if I have different information, let's say as a teacher or a coach or a, a supervisor, um, what does it mean to take that supportive stance of accepting where a person is and then adding to it? I think that's um, that's pretty cool because I mean, like I like I told you, uh, I mentioned earlier, you know, with the students that I work with, uh, there a lot of a lot of them have other issues. Issues is probably the wrong term to say. But they have other stuff going on. Um, so <laughs> if they can accept that in themselves, much like much like I've accepted, you know, my my vision issues um, and and the speech impediment that, that kind of creeped in over the last year, um, you know, doing that will allow me to, for one, I mean, I don't, I don't want to be too, uh, too hokey here, but I mean, it allows me to have a better life because I'm, yeah. I've accepted what I have and much like I've been accepting that glass of milk, even though I, I, I just, I, I think that's, um, that's, um, very interesting to, to be able to, so if we could do that with the, a group of kids from the uh, school for the blind and get them to realize how that acceptance of of their of their uh glass of milk or whatever it is for them accepting that will allow them to be able to um to live, lead a full life because what's funny is uh, i mean i look at and i'm i'm at, i'm talking too much here but i look at <laughs> what i <laughs> yeah exactly um i look at what um what others view as disabilities and i know that the students there they can do so much more than you could have ever imagined if you just imagine a world where uh, a world where disabilities don't really exist disabilities exist in your mind um but that's I, I mean, I, I go back and I think about it because just a few years ago, before I worked at the school, I had this um, pre, 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 um, pre notion, preconception um, mm -hmm. that that um, you know the students there. I mean, they why would they hate, even have stuff on the walls? Why, why would they have pictures on the walls? Uh, that's really uh, ignorant of me to to think that. Why would they want to go on vacation? They can't see vacation. You know, that's also ignorant of me because it's it's allowing them to get into a different space and hear different things and see more to, to experience different things. So yeah, I mean that that has been so hard for me to overcome and I want to be able to help other people do that as well. So um yeah, I think you know, that's great. I, I think that's that's the challenge of diversity, right? We we don't know what we don't know. And so if we can create the conditions where we can connect with diverse human beings and allow them to bring all their prior knowledge and experience into the space, then then we can learn about that and you know do a mutual process of acceptance and support. Because I think you're right, you know, there's there's acceptance that's needed on both sides. Um, so, you know, one of the things I love about improv is that the, the, the raw materials that we use to create these stories are our lived experiences. And so when I work with a group of students, yes, of course, I would love to know all about them, their cultural backgrounds, their uh, abilities, their, you know, uh, gender, all, all the different ways that they identify and the things that they've done. Um, but that's a big challenge for teachers. And it, it's one that they have to meet ongoing. But again, one way to do that is to create a space where your students get to bring that to you and share that with you 
in creating stories and, and you can learn it that way um, rather than having to sort of be an, try to be an expert on everything, which is impossible. Hmm. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, that's uh, that's interesting. So uh, how do you get into this kind of work? Oh, uh, <laughs> it was like very accidental. Um, when I was a freshman in college, I took an intro to theater course and really liked the instructor. And the following summer, I was walking downtown in New Haven, Connecticut. And my, my theater professor was the artistic director of a small theater. And I saw it walking downtown New Haven. I said, oh, I'll, I'll go check out Amy's theater. Amy Seaham is her name. And she's um, still teaching in the university setting and has some great books to check out. Um, so I went to check out the theater and on the door was a sign that said improv auditions. And I don't even think I knew what that meant. Um, because at that time, I think my association with improv was a show called Evening at the Improv, which was a stand up comedy show, um, e which is a, a e evening at the improv. Oh, evening yeah. at the improv. <laughs> yeah. Um, so anyway, I saw the sign and I decided to walk in and audition. So I did. And um, they cast me in a show and they put me in classes and I fell in love with it. And uh, not too much later, I also went back to grad school to get a master's and a teaching certification. So my journey as an improviser and my journey as a teacher were side by side kind of from the start. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be able to student teach with a high school teacher who taught English and theater and one of his classes was for a student, students with moderate disabilities. And I got to, for my student teaching project, I got to design an improv unit for that theater class. Um, so right away, I was using improv to work with students with disabilities as an educator. And so the, the, the two have just been connected ever since. Wow. That's uh, that's truly inspiring. Uh, I mean, because I, mean, I, I like I said, I, I, I want to be able to help other people like like me to go through the process like you have done a long, long time ago. Um, but I know the the value that that would bring to some people. Um, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, so when you're when you're with a group of people and doing this um, doing this uh, activities and different activities. How does it make you feel? Um, joyful. Uh, yeah, I, I especially love introducing improv to people who've never done it before. Because um, they generally start out nervous. And then they end up just laughing and having a great time. And really, really telling me by the end that they feel more like themselves than they have in a while, um, especially in professional settings. So like working with teachers and that kind of thing uh, is really fulfilling. So I, I love to see that that kind of spark of discovering something new that they really enjoy. So if I wanted to get into improv, how would I do that? Oh boy, I, there are so many ways. Um, you can, uh, you know, watch some of those shows that like, I think the, the CW Seed website has all the episodes of Whose Line Is It Anyway on it. Oh, yeah. um, there's a great uh, three episode series on Netflix of Middle Ditch and Schwartz that's a, a different, like the Whose Line is kind of a short game based improv, whereas Middle Ditch and Schwartz is more of a like an hour long single storyline. Middle um, Vision Schwartz? I'll put it, yeah, in the chat. Mid Thomas Middle Ditch. Oh, okay. And Ben Schwartz. And Ben Schwartz, people might know from um, Parks and Rec. He played a character named Jean Ralphio, who was a pretty wild character. Huh. Um, but even so, even just that, watching that, you could kind of see like a variety of how improv is done. Yeah. Um, and then from there, you know, there are classes available online, there probably are classes available locally. Um, and, uh, you know, visit my website and get in touch with me if you don't find anything else. And I definitely can um, find something for you. So I, I would say if you're interested in it, jump in. That's mm. the way to do it. And, the, you know, the truth is that we're all improvising every day anyway. 
Um, <laughs> yeah. We, we, we may not do it as a form of entertainment, um, but, you know, we're all making it up as we go along, whether we like to admit it or not. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I never mm-hmm. really, uh, I never really thought of it that way, but yeah, life is improv. It is. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I have to warn you, once you get into it, you start to see everything is improv. <laughs> <laughs> uh, interesting. Well, so what do you think the biggest factor in your success is? I, I, um, a long, a long time ago, I listened to a podcast. I think even before they were called podcasts, it might have been a radio show, um, <laughs> where uh, somebody was talking about the concept of vocation, like vers- versus your job. You know, the vocation is this kind of thing that you're called to. And they said, um, you know, if you can find the place where your passion meets the needs of the world, that's where you want to be. And I, I, I've honestly just been lucky. Um, to be able to do that, to continually explore my passion and connect with people and find ways that that can meet their needs. Um, And so for me, success is that I'm enjoying what I do. I feel good about what I do. I learn and grow from what I do. And the people that I work with tell me that this it's the same thing for them. Um, So that's where I want to be. So what does the next level of success look like for you? Uh, well, you know, these past couple of years, success has been, frankly, keeping uh, our programs alive, keeping camp alive, like moving from a highly interactive face-to-face process to an online camp has been a challenge, and it's one that we've met and we've sustained it. Um, so for me, the next level of success is to hopefully get back into a world where we can start to think about growth um, versus just trying to stay alive. Um, So for us, that means, um, you know, continuing to diversify our funding because our camp is free for families and for teachers. Um, Continuing to support uh, educators after they come to camp and learn those techniques to go back to their schools and put them into practice and share them with their colleagues and see that scale and grow exponentially. Um, yeah, so in a nutshell, that's, that's what success looks like. The next level looks like for me is growth. Yeah, that's cool. Uh, so uh, what are some obstacles or challenges you're still, you're still trying to overcome? Uh, you know, one big thing is um, it's a very well-intentioned focus focus on the kids we serve. Um, And and the real secret to camp is that it's about changing the teaching and learning environment. Um, So if you think about a single educator, they're going to work with hundreds of kids over the life of their career. Many more kids than I could possibly serve in any kind of summer program. And so when I work with 10 or 12 teachers every session, we're talking about impacting the lives of thousands of kids. Mm -hmm. And a a challenge is that lots of people, including funders, want to focus on the kids and working one-on-one with kids. But what that really means is they still envision disability as something that's located within that kid. But we know, again, going back to the beginning of this interview, that it's about the environment that we create and changing the environment. And so the the ongoing challenge is really to help people and especially our funders to see that, that the way we scale our impact and sustain our impact is to invest in teachers and in changing the school environment. Hmm. Wow. Yeah, um, that's that's uh, spot on. Very good. I love that. So what are some of the, who, uh, let me ask you this, who helps you to see your blind spots? Because I mean, we, we all have blind spots. We all have, we all have a cognitive bias uh, in, in some way, um, but who helps you see yours? Um, the, the diverse people that I work and play with uh, are the ones. And so, you know, that's an ongoing challenge too, um, in terms of, um, 
you know, our teaching force is largely white. Um, and in the world of autism, um, there's under identification of uh, women with autism. There's under identification of people of color and black people um, with autism. And so that means that it limits the diversity of the people that I get to work with and play with and learn from. Um, and so we, we need to to keep moving forward and changing that and creating a more diverse teaching force and finding the resources and support to get a more diverse group of students to be able to come to camp and, and that sort of thing. So how do you think how do you think we can we can change that or you can change that and make sure that you have more diverse diversity? Um, I think in the world of improv, we have to help young people to see themselves in that world. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if you if you do what I said and you go and you watch those improv programs, you're going to see mostly white men. Um, and as a white man, I'm, you know, I'm not uh, uh, apologizing for that or saying there's anything wrong with that, but it is it's limited. Um, and so I think we can help young people to see theater and improv and the creative arts and those kinds of things as something that's theirs by um, creating more programs in schools uh, that are predominantly students of color, black students, et cetera. Um, and, and then um, helping them to develop the skills to be coaches and instructors and teachers so that next generations of young people of color and black students are taught by teachers of color and black teachers. Um, and so we, we grow the, the diversity that way. Hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Wow, I, I cannot believe that our time is already up. I mean, this, I has, been, <laughs> this has been incredible. Um, so appreciative of you being on today. This has been phenomenal. Um, thank you. Thank you. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. So, uh, and if anyone on on the um, the podcast is listening in, if you're listening live, put a hashtag live. If you're listening on replay, put a hashtag replay. If you want to find more information out about Jim, uh, go to that URL there, the yesand.indiana.edu, and you can find out more. Are there other ways that people can reach out to you? Um, you know, that's really the, the best way. There's a contact form there and I'm pretty responsive. So uh, I would say that. I mean, uh, I, I do have the benefit of a last name that kind of terrifies people to try to pronounce and spell it. But also that means if you Google Jim and Saldo, you're going to find me, not somebody else with that <laughs> name. <laughs> yeah. So I, I, I did say it right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, well, that's good. Awesome. Well, thank you so much, Jim. And um, everyone that does it on, please uh, go out to Jim's site, look it up, uh, and you know, Google, Google Jim Ansaldo, you'll find him. Um, yep. But thank you so much for being on today. I'm gonna, if you're it's okay with you, I'm gonna send you to the green room, and then you can hang out there for a little bit, and I'll come back. I'll I'll close out the show, and we will uh, get things going. But thank you. Awesome. Thank you. All right. Brian. All right. Cool. Thanks, Jim. Wow. Now, there is so much that we all can learn from Jim Ansaldo and the improv abilities that we all have in, our, in ourselves. So, yeah, there's a lot to learn there. And I really want to do that. I, I really want to know more about this world. So I'm, I've had multiple friends that have recommended that I do that, and I think I am going to do it. So um, anyway, uh, coming up next week, we don't have a show for you next week because that is the week that my oldest son gets married. Yes, uh, Grant is going to get married in Cincinnati, and he will get married on Friday of that week, so the, the 10th, but yes, it's uh, it's mayhem, we're all getting ready for that, and it's just been, uh, been a great time. So, no no show next week, but the week after that, there will be a gentleman on, and his name is James Rabalata. James Rabalata. so he's coming on, and if you want, want to be able to Google his name, his last name is spelled R O B. I L O T T A Rob Balata. So James will be here on the uh, the 13th. Look forward to that. And as always, if there is ever anything else that we can do for you, let us know. But as always, keep one eye 
on the road.